So today's presentation is on carnivorous plants. <gasps> it's a piranha plant. It's a piranha plant. What are carnivorous plants? Carnivorous plants, to be defined as carnivorous, have to have at least one attribute that's specifically for the attraction, capture, or digestion of prey, uh, and the ability to absorb the nutrients from that prey and thus gain an advantage from those nutrients. So what I'm seeing here is that we are all carnivorous plants. <laughs> <laughs> I think you also have to be a plant. Oh. So where do carnivorous plants live? Well, yeah. they live in very uh, nutrient poor environments usually specifically waterlogged environments such as bogs so we're going back to the bog they're bog champs carnivorous plants are bog champs they are bog champs <laughs> so waterlogged environments um mean that so they are typically very acidic and they're anaerobic which means that the sort of bacterial and um, microorganisms that usually would break down organic material and make it available for plants to absorb can't survive very easily in those waterlogged environments that um that bogs contain mm. so specifically uh they typically are very low in available nitrogen so nitrogen is extremely uh, common in the air. It's like 70%. But that all that nitrogen isn't available for plants to use and, until it's been um, converted into like a, a molecule that it can actually make use of. And it's usually uh, types of bacteria that will do that process. And you might know that like legumes like peas and beans and things um are known as nitrogen fixing plants so if if you've got people will use fertilizer to add nitrates to the soil but if you have legumes they can do it themselves but it's actually not the plants themselves that do it they have a symbiotic relationship with bacteria that will fix the nitrogen into the soil so you can't just throw peas on a field and it'll be fine. <laughs> no, <laughs> but they. But if you if you do plant peas in a field, it will restore the nitrogen in the field. It's just that it also it it does that through a symbiotic relationship with bacteria. It's not um, the plant itself doing it, although it is because of the plant. So carnivorous plants, uh, they they crop up in these waterlogged environments that are super low in available nitrogen. So they survive by gaining those nutrients and specifically nitrates as well from prey. And they also, because the resources that they have to dedicate to catching and digesting prey take up so much of the plant's capacity, especially um, through using modified leaves that are very inefficient at photo uh, photosynthesizing. They also require a an environment that's very um, light and has lots of water, mm. so that respiration is super. So the photosynthesis is super easy, so that they can dedicate so much resources to capturing the other nutrients that they need from prey. So that's really interesting. I assumed that carnivorous plants got all of the things that they needed and didn't need photosynthesis, but they do need photosynthesis. They just yeah. also need to eat flies. Yeah, absolutely. The The resources they get from the prey is just nutrients and they still get their energy. Like, yeah, all of their energy they still mostly get from photosynthesis. So basically what, they're, what we're saying is for carnivorous plants... A fly is a bit like a multivitamin. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so some some types of carnivorous plants. Oh, that's gory, isn't it? Fly paper traps. <laughs> and fly paper traps catch prey with sticky glue 
and they have uh, little glands on stalks that catch uh, catch insects. On our left, we've got uh, a butterwort type of flypaper trap, which has these short, uh, sticky, secreting glands. And on the right, we've got a sundew type uh, flypaper trap. And these the sundews is is one of, one of the plants that I saw and um, when I went to the bog in mm-hmm. in sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely prefer the sundew one because it distra- it's a bit better at distracting from the dead fly, which is not that pleasant <laughs> to look at. <laughs> I mean, well, it, it, it's very gory, this photo. Yeah. <laughs> is it going to get gory? It does get a bit gory. So um, the sundews, they're, those long uh, stalks actually are mobile tentacles. Mm. So when it's not just that, so you've, you, you've got passive and active type traps and, you know, some, some will just, an insect's just going to stick to it and then it'll be digested over time. Some of them are really active and they, they fold around and they grab and they catch it and then they envelop it and then digest it. But not like on oh, purpose, just like in the same kind of way as plant leaves move with the sunlight. It's a chemical thing, right? It's, it's right, not... but, you know, on purpose, that's, yeah, you could yeah, say yeah. that about any of our bodily processes, right? We're, they're not necessarily controlled. I'm very I mean, controlled. Yeah. I mean, I go, to the, I, I go to the toilet on purpose. I'm pretty certain <laughs> I... <laughs> there's, there's two kinds of ways that the plant movement is controlled, and that's through... Um, either rapid cell growth or but the faster one is through sort of inflating and deflating cells Mm. very rapidly um but the the one on the right is very is is one that is very visibly mobile but the the butterworts even also have very subtle movement in order to better capture and digest prey so they will if something lands on them they'll subtly change shape to cup the insect slightly and that prevents rainwater from washing it away and it also captures water and bacteria that will help digest Mm. the insect Mm. but sungees the the one on the right are actually and there's lots and lots of different types as well um are actually so reliant on prey as their source of nutrients that they act specifically as the source of nitrogen that they typically lack the enzyme nitrate reductase which most which most plants need in order for them to use nitrates from the soil Mm -hmm. so it doesn't get nitrogen from the soil, mm. it only gets nitrogen from it's prey. All in. Yeah. Wow. Invested. Go big in or go carnivory. home, that's what I say. Exactly. It's an obligate carnivore. Yes. Here's a, here's a little treat. Ooh. That is a sundew uh, capturing an insect. And you can see all those tentacles like curling around to cover it. It's unpleasant, isn't it? Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> it's, I feel sad and amazed. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we've got pitfall traps. Oh, it's weeping bow. Is that that's a Pokemon, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's the really weird looking Pokemon. Yeah, it's it's the really weird. It's <laughs> the really weird looking Pokemon. <laughs> so, pitcher plants are carnivorous plants that have a pitfall trap uh, made up of modified leaves that have kind of cupped around like this. And they contain at the bottom of this trap a digestive liquid. And that liquid can either be just rainwater that's got digestive bacteria in it, like a symbiotic relationship with microorganisms that will digest anything that falls in. But it may be actually digestive enzymes that are specially created by the plant for the purpose of digesting prey. Um, And most 
picture traps are lined with a sort of waxy scales that that kind of fall away and, and encourage insects to fall in kind of like how uh butterflies or mm. moths have these loose scales that fall off and the traps use uh, like like all of these carnivorous plants they use bright colors and, and nectar and smells to attract insects or whatever prey they're targeting what would happen if you stuck your finger in it <laughs> nothing <laughs> so it's 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 the kind of digestion that it's like slow you're not going to put your finger out and that comes just just your, your um your bone no it's it would be very cool if, if it did i mean it wouldn't be wouldn't be cool i would like to put my finger in it yeah me it too. does look like it would fit and be nice <laughs> I want to know how it feels yeah. to put my finger Waxy, in that little perfect. finger shaped <laughs> picture. <laughs> okay, you do you. <laughs> you don't want to know <laughs> when my finger gets stuck. All I can think of is my finger coming off. <laughs> just you just it pull would... it away, and it's just like a steaming bone. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm imagining. Just I wouldn't want to do that. Um, and pitcher plants often also have a lid, um, which you can see in this one, which protects the pitcher from rainwater, which mm. can dilute that digestive liquid. Mm. You want this kind of like stagnant body of liquid, basically, to digest, to, to develop the right kind of uh, ecological conditions to digest things that fall in. And this is Nepenthes raja in Borneo, which is a species of pitcher plant, which is the largest species of pitcher plant and can hold up to 3.5 litres of water. That's why it's the king. The king. And uh, some, some of the largest pitcher plants, including this one, have been known to trap small vertebrates such as rats and frogs and even birds. However, it's not so large so that it can consume such big animals because they it's quite rare, it's very occasional that they'll get trapped in such large pitcher plants, which leads to the obvious question of why did they get so big? <laughs> go big or go home, that's what I say. Which takes us to pitcher <laughs> or toilet bowl. <laughs> Well, this is the least nightmarish so far. <laughs> I mean, I did. I, I was thinking that it looked a little bit like a toilet, but I wasn't going to say it because I didn't want right. to. Like, I didn't want to bring the tone of the show down. <laughs> I thought we were being high class. It's even got like a little U bend and a toilet lid. It's it's become clear that these giant pitcher plant species actually get most of their nutrients that they can't get from the soil from feces. They have a symbiotic relationship specifically with uh, rats and mountain tree shoes and also tree shrews and also um, some kinds of bird apparently that come up to the opening of the pitcher plant and they they take away some of the nectar that mm -hmm. the pitcher pr plant provides on on the lid. And whilst they're there, they poop in the toilet bowl. Um, apparently, as a, this is like a territory marking kind of thing, they, they poop um, where they eat. <laughs> smart. <laughs> yeah, smart to poop where you eat. I'm not going to ask the same question I asked about the finger. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the mouth of the pitcher is basically perfectly sized to suit the body length of the average tree shrew so it's really specifically adapted for actually this purpose of collecting poop from from these small mammals um and it it, it it seems that the majority of nitrogen provided to these plants comes from these droppings and so that is what explains mm. their size rather than the ability to catch very large prey mm. And there's also some other pitchers that have got very large that are primarily uh, that they, they primarily get their nutrients from capturing leaves 
as well from other plants and then oh, those leaves are digested within the pitcher as well that's not too bad i don't mind them eating leaves <laughs> i'd rather they didn't eat i'd rather they didn't eat poop <laughs> so now snap traps the classic these are the, the, the ones. classic ones yeah you've got your Day venus fly trap but when yeah exactly but the one i didn't know about was the water wheel plant and it's like that this is like an aquatic venus fly trap oh. Um, and this one's caught a little fish. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, so th- these snap traps have hairs on the lobes of these modified leaves, which when they're triggered, they snap shut and capture the insects that triggered them. And because... Uh, you know, they put a lot of energy into maintaining the state of these leaves and being ready to like snap shut at any moment and they don't want to waste that. So, so that they won't be like triggered shut just by rainwater or by debris that's blown around by the wind or anything, they actually have a simple memory. Hmm. So in order for it to snap shut, it actually requires two stimuli that's, 0.5 0.5 to 30 seconds apart oh, wow. and which means it needs to hold the memory of what's happened in order for it to like be triggered by those those two events in sequence and then more struggling uh once the insect's trapped more struggling inside then triggers it to invest in hermetically sealing around the insect and forming a stomach where it pumps in these digestive enzymes to digest the insect so it's really really clever like it it's got this whole kind of cycle and it and it it digests the insect over a a period of a couple of weeks i know the thing you're not meant to do with venus flytraps is purposefully make them snapshot because it just wastes all their energy yeah exactly kill them by doing that then we've got bladder traps, and this is another one that I saw when I went to a bog. Mm-hmm. Um, so bladder traps are super interesting because they uh, they basically pump ions out from the centre of this bladder. They they pump all the kind of salts and things out, and then the and that's like an active process by the cells. And then that causes the water to follow through osmosis. And that creates like a little partial vacuum inside the bladder. And then when anything goes past and triggers one of these uh, little hairs at the entrance of the bladder, that that vacuum is exposed then and they get sucked in. That's really cool. (laughs) Yeah. It's a great gift. I could watch it for hours. And then once the prey is sucked in, then it is dissolved by digestive secretions from the plant. Um, so now this is the tweet that sparked my interest in carnivorous plants in the first place. Um, Ooh. The tweet that inspired this presentation. Did you know that tomato plants are carnivorous? The little sticky hairs on the stem traps on, on the stem trap small insects that then die, fall to the ground and decompose and become absorbed mm. by the roots. This is a passive carnivore compared to an active carnivore like the Venus flytrap. Does that mean that tomatoes aren't vegan? <laughs> <laughs> well, ultimately, everything we eat is recycled. Yeah, circle of life. Isn't it? Blah, blah. But, but what do we think, based on this tweet and what we've learned about carnivorous plants, do we think this is true? Do we think tomato plants are carnivorous based on this description? No, based on no, because that's no, plants? no, no, because they they absorb they don't absorb the nutrients through the roots. That's the one thing that they can't do. Mm. They do it through the little stomachs and shit. Right. So, one of the characteristics of a carnivorous plant is that it has some way to digest the prey, and that can either be through uh like secreting digestive enzymes itself or through creating like a symbiotic relationship with organisms that can do the digestion for it so it uh causing insects to die and then also benefiting from the nutrients of those dead insects around it isn't necessarily enough to classify it as a carnivorous plant 
Lots of plants have defensive adaptations, such as the sticky hairs found on plants like tomatoes and potato stems, which can trap and kill insects, which can additionally provide nutritional benefit. And it's likely that carnivorous plants evolved out of such defensive adaptations in specifically circumstances Mm -hmm. where especially nutrient poor soils meant that the nutrients gained from the prey exceeded the cost of investing in carnivorous adaptations such as lures, digestive enzymes and modified leaf structures which are inefficient for photosynthesis. So this is where we come to this kind of degrees of carnivory kind of picture of plants. So lots and lots of plants have Mm -hmm. defensive mechanisms which may kill animals occasionally. Um, Some of them benefit nutritionally from that and then some of them are in such nutritionally deprived circumstances that they have to adapt specifically to capture and kill. And even we talked about in my episode on plants and fungi having like symbiotic relationships with other organisms that do the trapping and the killing specifically for the benefit of the plant so that the plant survives so that the fungi can can feed off them right so there's um there's one kind of plant that has really sticky leaves so that it catches insects so that an assa- the assassin bug can mm. kill can can eat those insects and then the drop the, the poop of the assassin bug is what feeds the plant. Whoa. <laughs> Little plants eating poop here. <laughs> yeah. In like my list of nightmares, I'm I'm stuck between two of these plants. It's either that one you just mentioned because there's an assassin involved. It's quite scary. <laughs> or it's the one where you're a shrew on the toilet and then all of your friends can see that you're on the toilet in the open. And you didn't realise you were in the open, but then you were. <laughs> yeah, that's a horrible nightmare. I'm, I'm <laughs> sure I've had nightmare. that one a few legit times. <laughs> I will say, I will say, non-carnivory plants are valid. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All plants are valid. <laughs> um, so, the, those plants that seem like on the way to being carnivorous that have some adaptations that it seems like it benefits nutritionally from killing insects, um, but you wouldn't necessarily strictly define it as a carnivorous plant. Um, They're often called proto-carnivorous plants or uh, paracarnivorous plants. Um, So we've got a lovely example here, which is one of my favorite plants, which I only learned whilst researching this presentation is considered uh, potentially a proto carnivorous plant because the seeds of the shepherd's purse, once they get wet in the soil, they develop this uh, sticky mucus around the seed. But this seed actually kills worms. Mm. So it, 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 it attracts and kills uh, oh. worms especially and also other kinds of insects and also benefits nutritionally from those dead insects and they've done studies that show that the the, the plants where they've grown in soil with worms um, and that have killed and digested the worms grow better um, okay. or like faster, they germinate faster yeah, hum- humble little shepherd's purse plant yeah. Holding dark secrets. That's, well, which that's one's, carnivorous plants for you. Which one's your nightmare then, Nat? Nat um, the flight. Okay. The one that sounds most nightmarish to me was when I was looking up the bladder plants, there was a description of what happens when it's when it sucks in stuff that's too big Mm -hmm. so most often it's just like water daphnia little little tiny water fleas and it's sucking them into the bladder but sometimes it's sucking in things like tadpoles (laughs) or like uh mosquito larvae and things and they're too big to fit in but it can digest and like keep sucking them in (laughs) Like them, <laughs> like a noodle, just like. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So that's Bagram. 